Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, seven o'clock uh, on the dot, and uh, welcome to our June meeting. Um, to everyone that's out there in Zoom land, uh, uh, we didn't think we'd be doing this again, but uh, we better get used to it. We may be doing that a few more times. Just a few little uh, housekeeping things before we get going. Um, just if everyone could mute themselves. Uh, uh, you might think that you're not going to talk, but the phone rings in the background and we all hear it or your wife or someone comes in. So just that, uh, turn off your mics. It's on a PC. It's in the bottom left-hand corner. I'm not sure on iPads or any other devices. Um, just a reminder that the, the session is filmed and goes out on YouTube. So uh, if you're uh, conscious of yourself, just make sure that you've, you know, put your makeup on and combed your... Uh, those of you that can comb their hair so that we look presentable and uh, that. So uh, welcome everyone. And uh, tonight we've got two speakers. We've got Dr. Kirsten Ellis and she is uh, lead of the Inclusive Technology Group in the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash University. Is a superstar of STEM. I mean, if I don't put of STEM, you'll just think she's a superstar. An inventor of tape block. She is enthusiastic about using technology to create a more inclusive society. She brings together technology and creativity to produce innovative solutions to real world problems. Her research interests include human computer interaction when she utilizes her experience in designing, developing and evaluating systems for people to advance the field of inclusive technologies. Our other speaker is Nathan Sherbone. As CEO of Flux, Nathan spends his time working with education around the world to find new and innovative ways to amplify teachers' knowledge and experience and increase the level of engagement and interactivity in classrooms. Before Flux, Nathan spent four years working on a PhD in education technology, but dropped out to build his vision for the future of learning. In his spare time, he enjoys reading about long-termism, effective altruism, moral philosophy, and essential ex 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 existential risk. Oh, I have trouble with some words. Flux is a Melbourne-based startup on a mission to make teaching and learning interactive and fun. Flux provides teachers with a one-click solution for live polls, Q&As, feedback, and more. Since its first release just a few years ago, the Flux platform has been used by more than 4,000 teachers and 100,000 students with over 4.9 million unique responses from FUSE's students to date. I must tell you, uh, um, uh, I hit the grand 80 last year and my daughter wanted to take me back to where I was born, which was Warrnambool. Uh, obviously, we didn't make it, but she took me down this year for my 81st birthday and uh, she took me to my old uh, primary school, which I left there when I was seven. And my goodness, do they do it differently? Um, no, uh, no blackboards, no chalk. The kids are scattered all over the place. You, no inkwells. Uh, it was a totally different uh, uh, atmosphere than I was here. Anyway, our, uh, 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 the presentation tonight has been moderated by our president, David Stonia Gibson. So over to you, folks. Oh, OK. Thank you, Peter. And uh, welcome, everybody, to this. I hope it's going to be a great meeting. Um, just getting my settings changed a little bit. And uh, if you're not going to be speaking, could you just mute your microphones if you haven't already done so? just in case the dog comes bounding in at the wrong moment. Uh, so welcome to Kirsten with the with the big smile and welcome to Nathan with a, uh, okay, not a bad smile either. Uh, it's interesting. Do you two know each other from before? I don't, I, I actually was looking through my emails because I thought your, your name sounded familiar, Kirsten. And um, I realized I actually reached out to you really early on when I was starting my PhD. Um, as a potential supervisor. So I'm not sure if that, you probably don't remember five years ago when I sent you an email, but um, I, yeah, but that's the only time I think we've ever really um, come into contact. 
Yeah, well, that's, that's fascinating, isn't it? So you work in the same place, almost sort of kind of in the same space about education, uh, unless it took Melbourne PC user group to bring the two of you together. Isn't that wonderful? That's right. So the whole club should be very proud of that. <laughs> I, I think I've actually used Nathan's software, though. Oh, oh. You, so you've used Flux. <laughs> yeah. Oh, before, it, before it was Flux, it had another name, yes? Yeah, it was called Mars earlier. Mars. So I used it when it was Mars. So I was probably one of those horrible people who put in complaints because I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I well, think thanks to you, it actually was able to be turned into a product, I guess. So <laughs> I appreciate all the complaints. <laughs> I was going to say this could be a chance to get your money back, Kirsten. <laughs> or charge consultancy, one or the other. So, so what, Nathan, so in, in a, well, give us a little rundown then on, on what your software does and, 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 and how it contributes to education. Yeah, so uh, I guess the real problem that, we wanted to solve for lecturers and for students is um, student engagement. So, I mean, we were, I, I was fairly recently a university student um, and sitting through, you know, hours of lectures and finding that I really wanted to have more engagement, like the best parts of the lectures were really when I got to speak to the lecturer afterwards and clarify things or, um, or if I was talking to the person next to me to clarify something. Um, and so I wanted to try and bring some of that uh, connection, the, the interactiveness and the connecting connection that you get from actually uh, interacting with people uh, into the more traditional lectures. Um, and so basically what we did to, to try to address that is we've created uh, Flux, which, which allows you to run kind of quick polls, live polls. Um, so you can kind of quickly, uh, you know, beam out to the students, what's the, uh, uh, you know, um, Trying to think of a quick question, um, you know, what's um, uh, Ohm's law? And then you can have five different options and the students can kind of yep. answer A, B, C or D. Yep. And instantly uh, on the lecturer's screen, you can see that, you know, 50% have said it's A and 30% have said it's B. And so it, it gives a, the lecturers a bit of an idea of what the students are thinking and whether or not they're on track. Um, but it also gives the students a little bit of a chance to direct the course of the lecture. You know, if, if they're really not understanding something, then, um, you know, maybe we might spend another five minutes or something going, going through some of the, uh, the content or clarifying misconceptions. So um, polling is kind of the main, the main part, but there's other features as well. So um, students can actually text in a question similar to the, the Zoom chat that um, we're all looking at now. So um, there's a function like that, but for the real world lectures as well, like, well, not real world, but face-to-face uh, lectures where, um, where yeah, students can kind of uh, text in a question and and then upvote. The other students can upvote the vote vote those questions to the top, and then um, the lecturer can kind of focus on just the, the the burning questions that all of the other students really want to ask, and um, you know just address those ones, um, which which hopefully will be a little bit more helpful to the rest of the class. Okay, so that sort of almost bounces a little bit off what um, Peter said before about the, the um, classroom um, scenario has changed a lot in the intervening years since he and I were sitting in the classroom as obedient little students, and I'm sure Peter was obedient as well. Um, and I'm sort of seeing myself sitting in a, in a lecture theatre as I did many years ago with, with 250 students on rate seating and, and a, a lecturer down at the on the ground level. And, and what I can't see in my mind's eye, of course, is that all those students have got uh, laptops or tablets or something sitting there with in their hands. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm guessing then that this was really sort of born out of that scenario rather than what the one we're in at the moment. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Because um, we we started, I started building uh, some of basically what, what turned into Flux in around 2012 or 2013. Um, so it was really, as you say, it was when mobile phones, you know, the iPhone was coming out, what, 2008 or 2007, something like that. So it was a couple of years after iPhones had come out. And, um, you know, we, we found that most students, probably 90% plus, had a, a internet connected mobile phone that they could use for, for quickly answering questions. And so um, 
my uh, my PhD supervisor and I kind of really got excited by that idea, um, especially because um, you know things hadn't really changed. I've got a photo, a famous. There's a famous photo on the Wikipedia page for lecture. So if you go to Wikipedia and just type lecture, there's a a photo of, or a drawn drawn picture of a lecture from I think it's 17th century Italy, and it looks it looks identical to the lectures that I sat in, <laughs> you know, in 2008, yeah. 2009, 2010. Yeah. And so, you know, like it's something that's a hundred, hundreds of years old and it hasn't really changed all that much. And yet, you know, within this tiny little f fragment of time where I was at university, it really, it, it started to change. And that was just really exciting for me. I just, the possibilities were endless and yeah. there's new technology. So yeah, it was just a really interesting space to start experimenting in yeah yeah i think probably the only difference between 17th century and 20th 21st century is just that they didn't have overhead projectors and it was all <laughs> done by candlelight wasn't it but otherwise yeah, yeah pretty much the same when, when you started saying that i thought of the royal society and these guys in their um stiff collars and what have you demonstrating their frog legs and metal plates and what have you <laughs> yeah so um and kirsten your uh um well tell us a little bit about your thing and and um tape blocks where did that really come from hello kirsten i haven't got a voice is it kirsten okay there we go yep okay so my technology is around inclusive technology not assistive technology so subtle dis difference Assistive technology is kind of saying there's something wrong, we're going to fix a problem. Where what I want to do is actually include everyone in the use of technology. And so um, I do that by trying to design activities that are inclusive of everyone. So no matter what your skill level, no matter what your uh, prior knowledge is, you can still participate. So I came up with these things called tape blocks. Now, I'm going to introduce you to George. This is George. Okay, say hi, George. Everyone. Hi, George. How are you going? <laughs> so Please George. do not unmute in order to say hi, George. <laughs> <laughs> um, give him a wave or something. So George is going to help me out. He, George is a mirror sitting at 45 degrees. And I'm using a laptop. Uh -huh. I put George over the top of there. All of a sudden, I can now, I thought your learning online thing was quite interesting. So now what I can do is you can actually hopefully see the tape blocks because all it's doing is projecting directly down. So these are tape blocks. They're EBA foam blocks, children's building blocks. They have conductive tape wrapped around them and components are inserted in or underneath. And then we can just turn them around. Now, this is a bicolored LED, so you can't fail when you use it. It's going to work no matter which direction you have it. And the great thing with these is people who have cerebral palsy or have motor issues can push them together with their hands. So Kirsten being Kirsten, someone was talking about a tinkering project. So Kirsten being Kirsten, what I did was, I'll just turn one more light on. I forgot that when I'm pushing down, light won't work as well sorry um so if you're blind um an led tape block isn't going to help you can people hear hear that yes it's a vibration motor so if you're blind you can make this circuit entirely by feel and then you can feel if you made it correctly and that's done by just inserting the wires underneath the um, conductive tape um, and then there's really just different sorts of so this is a red blue flashing so then LED so that then you can make other things creative things from that point and of course then I started going what else can you add we have uh, little tiny drone motors that run it um, under three you know with a three volt battery and you can actually stack like because the question is, how many of these can you actually stack? <laughs> and the answer is, you can actually stack more fans than you can green LEDs because they actually use less power. 
but it's a really exciting way of exploring how many things you know you can stack so instead of telling people you can get them you can ask them to answer their own questions you can ask them to come up with their own questions then you can do stuff like uh yeah for anyone who does arduino yes this is an arduino you know pcb mount button that's just inserted within the line of tape so that you can turn the fan. So you can introduce concepts like switches. I'll take George away for a second. And as you can tell, I get pretty excited by them. I, I think they're great. But so at, at the open day that I think um, Peter was talking about, so this one here is a tilt switch. So when you um, tilt it back and forth, Mercury tilt switch. So as you tilt it back and forth, it turns the the device on and off. Um, at, at that open, uh, I think the open day the same year, we, we ran the tape blocks and as an activity. And there was like a, you know, 15, 16 year old girl came up to me and it's like, oh, here, make a circuit. And she's like, oh no, I can't do that. My brother does that, but I can't make a circuit. And I'm like, what? You, you, you know, you, you grab these two things and you put them together. And she's like, oh, is that making a circuit? I can do that. And then not only did she make that circuit she actually made some blocks as well for herself so what it does is it changes people's perception of who can make things and who can't make things you can run it in a classroom um you know there's no so i actually get um migraines from soldering so no soldering involved you can do it in a classroom you can do it in big groups little groups i run it a lot with people with disabilities so basically um, we run this version which is the uh, for people with cerebral palsy, so people with significant motor disabilities. Um, you can make your own tape blocks. It takes, you know, um, just the tape and then inserting things over and under. Um, I'll grab George again. Here's George. So this, for those who don't recognise it, it's a breadboard. It's a very, very, very simple breadboard. <laughs> Two pieces of tape, battery carrier. And there's your breadboard. So sometimes when people are using breadboards, they have multiple, you know, lines and lines and lines of little tiny holes that you need to put things into and um, the LEDs or whatever into. It can be really hard to see or understand. This is the most obvious, you know, and when I, when I tend to present these, people are like, it's sort of like the most obvious idea ever that no one's ever thought of. <laughs> the breadboard right there. <laughs> yeah, for those who can see me, there's the breadboard. Yes, <laughs> that's very fine. That's 10 to the inch. And Sorry. you can imagine for a lot of people, that's just really hard to actually get. And it's also hidden. So in this, in this system, there is absolutely nothing that you can't see. So there's no magic to it. There's no, is anyone, can I have raised hands as to, is anyone freaking out because there's no resistors involved? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if I should ask or if uh, I should uh, uh, you, uh, yeah. not be the annoying guy that, that asks that question. <laughs> so should, I be using, should I be using things like this? No, but they work right? So you have a perception that you have to put resistors in. Now, if you're going to run them for a long period of time in multiple circuits, yes, you'd need resistors. The three volt batteries that I use have resistance built in. So I haven't even, I haven't blown a single LED, um, except I did one experiment with a capacitor when I really didn't understand what capacitors did. And I did manage to, <laughs> to pop an LED with that. So there's actually a lot more tolerance built in the, into these things. And what it does, you can actually, um, exactly like the yellow blocks, so the middle blocks, you can actually use resistors. So you can actually put in different resistors into this same type of block, and then you can actually teach resistors as well. I just find them really boring by comparison to all the other things that you can put in, like buttons, tilt switches, um, read switches, light um, so those, uh, I don't know, it's a little bit hard to see with the light. Um, light dependent resistors. So George is very helpful for doing demonstrations, you see. Um, so light dependent resistors, you can, um, you know, so it works exactly 
the same uh, and it's quite dim at the moment and it'll go all the way off and come back on a little bit more because it's not in that much light. Um, so that's my thing, but I, I really, I do braille keyboards. Oh, and there's one more, which is when you're introducing STEM to creative people or kids, if you tell them that this is STEM, so this little guy has a light up nose, then they can see why they might want to do STEM. You know, if you go, oh, let's make circuits, like, yeah, why would I want to do that? I know they're cool, you know they're cool, but not everyone knows they're super cool. But if you can say, we can make characters that light up, and some of, so I've done a lot of research, some people don't like the feel of the fur, so we can actually make dragons with light up noses as well, and that's just cut EVA foam. In disability, trains are huge. So we have a um, train kit that we can make. And of course, yes, there is a tape block vehicle coming. I haven't, so we, I can, you can actually use exactly the same technique to make a vehicle with a fan push car and that sort of thing. So, oh, and I get kind of excited about it. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. This the is ladies my, on the roll here. <laughs> this is my latest build. So this is bubble wrap, two lines of conductive tape. And it actually turns into a beautiful bracelet that changes. <laughs> right. So if you take that to your grandkids and say, do you want to make either a bracelet or a, uh, a gauntlet? Then all <laughs> of a sudden you start appealing to a whole lot of different people, you know? So um, it's really about making, 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 making meaningful for people. That's yep. my thing. Yep, yep. <laughs> I, I, I think the the bringing the creativity into it is, or sort of targeting creativity is is very creative, Kirsten. Um, little factoid you may not be aware of, you probably are, is that the Arduino microprocessor was initially designed and targeted at artists as well as educators. Um, and it was sort of a way to allow artists to do technological, technology-based whatever you call it, installation art or what have you, flashing lights and moving thingy, thingy revolves. Yeah. So this is actually a lily pad, which was yep. almost where I started my electronics. Yes. Um, so I'm actually a computer programmer, not actually an electronics expert by any stretch of the imagination. So I started that and I have basically large dry felting pieces that I do and program lights. So I have things like a lighthouse where the lights shine across the ocean and as the lighthouse spins and um, moon scenes where the moon lava changes and, you know, mm -hmm. things, uh, using yeah. that lily pad system. And it really is, it's, it's appealing to what is it that you're into? How can we make, you know, technology relevant to what it is that you do so that you can change the people who are interested and change the way that activities are designed so that they can be much more inclusive. Yeah. Did so. You you mentioned uh, sort of accessibility and and dis, people with disabilities. Um, was that the initial driving force, or education, or both? Uh, so the original idea for the tape blocks was um, people with disabilities. So I got a grant. I I put in one of those grants so that it's like we should do something to include people with disabilities in National Science Week because they are completely neglected and invisible mm. and then of course I got the grant and went now I have to work out how to do that mm. so being Kirsten being Kirsten I have um I tried laser cutting holes with multiple levels that you could put things into to drop at different levels I had um one version which is quite cool which is it, it has um a circuit over the top and you put it on a piece of metal to complete the circuit um, so lots of different ways of trying to make it as easy as possible. Even the tape blocks, I tried them in thin wood. I tried them in, you know, acrylic. I tried them in lots of different materials to see what was like acceptable and easy. And I kept coming back to the foam blocks because you can actually pull 
you can pull the components out and then push them in, which makes them um, useful for, for things, for through hole items. Mm-hmm. Um, but no one can be scared of them. You know, like there's no way, you, you know, it's that unintimidating block. Yeah. There's no way you can be scared of a, a foam block. Having said that, I did get some pushback, which is this is not grown up enough for me. So I've also got an all black set of tape blocks and the black and silver looks pretty professional. You know, like it, it just, it, so it, it, again, it's trying to pe- meet people where they're at. Very good. Um, Sorry. <laughs> anyone, <laughs> anyone got any questions after, after that? I love the way yeah. Kirsten keeps saying Kirsten. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Kirsten, you do a whole lot of things like flying and skiing and uh, um, sailing. And is there anything you don't do? That... <laughs> um, I drew the line at cave diving. So oh, yeah. I cave and I dive, but I don't cave dive because yeah. I have actually been stuck in a cave for a few hours and I, you know, that limited air supply. I've done wet caving. Um and kite surfing came along after I was kind of beyond doing some of the things that I was doing earlier. So hang gliding, I started hang gliding and then we I actually dislocated my elbow. So we moved across to um, uh, ultralights and now we fly GA. You see, as we get older, we sort of go for the, <laughs> the, the more sophisticated versions of things. But um, I, I'm very much a believer... At, so, so I fly and rock climb and a cave and, and hang glide, but I also play the piano and sing and do embroidery. And, like, I just don't think that there should be any limits. You know, it's like do the things you're good at doing. I can use a chainsaw and I can hang a gate, but I have no mechanical empathy at all. So I'm actually really bad in terms of there'll be smoke coming out of the chainsaw and people, we like the husband and all the kids will be coming up going, mum, stop. And I'm like, oh, is there a problem? I just thought it was running a bit oily. You know, it's actually burning its way through. Um, so, yes, definitely have limitations there as well. But um, I, I just believe that everyone should do, you know, have a go at it, everything. And, and it's only when you try things that you can know if they're actually going to be of interest to you or not. Wow. Yeah. For those those of you who've been into Morabin in the last uh, year and a half, there's actually been one of those. I, I made one of those tape blocks when I first met Kirsten, the, the one with the uh, red green LED and a battery on it. Uh, apropos which, um, and I'm, because Kirsten, I'm an electronics engineer, the first time I saw one connect, somebody connecting a battery directly to an LED, I nearly had a... a, a, a or some, something bad nearly happened, a stroke or something. Yep. But I since learned that uh, apparently in China, in some little back room uh, factory somewhere, you will find a little man with a button cell and an LED or a pile of LEDs testing the LEDs on a button cell like that. So you're in good company. And but- I, do, I do it routinely now. In fact, I've got a, a little light on my key ring which made just like that with... Um, a 3D printed case around my key. So you're in, you're in, you're an acceptable company because the internal resistance of the battery is sufficient to um, to do the job. Oh, exactly. So yeah. you, you can do it quite safely. Yes. Yeah. Um, and and in fact, when when I'm working with LEDs, just generally, I don't know about you, but I end up with extra like LED sitting around. So if I ever want to check the colours on the LED, you just put it straight over. Yep. Exactly. Yep. LED. So it makes it yep. easy. Yep. Mm. So and that's actually an expended battery sitting on my desk here that I, it came out of something where it wasn't working anymore. It still lights up an LED. So, so that's good. Yep. Um, I'd just like to ask uh, what's, uh, what, what the tape is. is it ah, the ca- tape is absolutely magic. For those who've used copper tape before, I, so there are some circuit making systems that use copper tape. The problem with copper tape is that it anodizes, so it, it, it um, or tarnishes, so it goes off very quickly. Um, this is actually, it's a nickel copper fabric tape. Um, it comes with a um, backing. Now, the hardest thing in the entire thing is starting 
one for the first time because they stick really badly. But once you've got it started, you only ever have to, you should only ever have to open a row of tape once. It's really, really super flexible. So copper tape, you could never, you know, bend it around corners and things like that. So here, if I make a tape block right now, so you get an LED, split the legs, pop it on top of the thing. Not going to be neat as I normally make them, okay? <laughs> uh, you go all the way around. This tape is just absolutely awesome. It's actually, I think it's called EM, EM something shielding. Yeah, EMC, EMC shielding EMC tape, shielding yes. Tape is actually what it is. So, of course, I'm completely rebadging it for <laughs> um, not the purpose it's meant for at all. Is it fairly cheap or is it pricey kind of stuff? That's um, the kind of stuff. I sell it on eBay for $25 for a 30-metre 30, 30 roll. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's so it, It's actually cheaper than um, uh, copper tape of the same size. But there is one thing with using it. You know how I struggled to start the tape at the, at the start? Next time I start the tape, I do that. So I have these hints and tips and it goes something like cut the silver, not the white. Always <laughs> cut the silver, not the white. And then you just and when you um, when you put the tape back down, copper tape will the same as this tape will will tend to fall off. So all I do is if you turn back the tape as a fraction. And it holds itself down and it means next time you go to open it, you can open it as well. So there's sort of a few hints. Same as you'll notice when I um, was making the block, some people will actually pull the, the backing off the tape and then try to wrap it around. But you've got all this stuff that's going to stick to itself. So it's like when you're, you're covering your school books, what you do is you only peel off the, a bit at a time as you're, um, as you're wrapping around. So I will use George. George is, George is awesome. Please tell all teachers about George. If they want to be able to see what students are doing, um, George is great for, for online classes because you can be you can actually see what students are doing on their desktop. So if they're typing or anything like that. So I only pull that much tape off and I, to keep it under control rather than pulling out the whole piece. And then as it goes around, I just pull a little bit more out and a little bit more out. Can you rip it or is it is it cut only? Cut only. You cannot rip it. I have never tried. And if you use it like this, you do occasionally have to clean your scissors because the gum does eventually come off. It's actually conductive glue, which is why you can put bits underneath as well as on top. So it's conductive underneath and conductive on top, which is the magic about it. So that is how you would make a battery block. It's cool, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm over enthusiastic, but I, I, I find this stuff really awesome. So I've actually made a, um, a bubble wrap dress, for example, using exactly the same technique. Um, yeah, so I can actually see if I can grab it. Um, so I did it as a making exercise um, with my students in class. So we had to run online last year. So what I did was actually run um, a um, make a space online. We sent out microcontrollers. So just the micro bits to everyone. And then they made things. And in class, we actually made things together. Um, so if I go into Zoom, can I just share my screen for a minute? Is that okay? Yep, go ahead. Okay. So there's stuff like, this was a little um, fairy. What was I doing in lockdown? Lots of people were fixing their houses and, and doing renovations and, and doing their gardens. What was I doing? I was building a fairy house because I could. And you'll see it's got little LEDs glowing in there and... Um, butterfly bracelets 
And this was the um, uh, dress that I made and it was actually programmed. So originally I made it just during classes, we were doing stuff just to encourage people to be a bit more creative and a bit more less fixed in their ideas. And I connected um, those wings. My kids are 18. I bought them when they were four and never used them. They've been sitting on top of the cupboard. So it was a great <laughs> excuse for actually using up the fairy wings. And um, so I just put it on top of, my daughter made chain mail um, when she was about 13, 7,000 farm fencing links. And um, so we have it on mannequin in the front hall. So I absconded with her, her mannequin and put this bubble wrap skirt over the top. And then it turned out really well. So I've actually bought a different mannequin and rebuilt the, um, the bubble wrap skirt as well. Uh, so I do a lot of work with resin and, and things like that. But even this is my rap, laptop cover um, that I currently have. Um, this was uh, some of the workshops what we actually ran using tape blocks. And the other thing that we used was some um, sparrows. So we had people driving sparrows over jumps and things like that, which they really enjoyed. Um, Modelling plastic and a threading activity. So uh, I was just going to show you. So this was the um, the felt um, the felting. Uh, so it's dry felting it has some um, and spaceships and so I do lots of um, arty things and I'll stop sharing now <laughs> but it, it's that how do you make it meaningful for you how do you make electronics programming meaningful for you and I, the when I'm teaching university students it's about you think that you're going to be programming apps or on a laptop but a lot of the programming that actually happens now is devices or I went to the, my horse ended up at a vet and they had an Arduino strapped to the horse's back, which was strapped to both its legs. So they could actually see where it was laying, you know, like um, programming technology is not just about, you know, programming for the computer screen anymore. It is much more than that. And we really need to get students and everyone thinking beyond just the, um, the you know, how do I program for the screen? I think you would, uh, or seeing your artistic leanings there, uh, I'm sure you would agree that computer programming is also a creative pursuit. It's not yep. a really mathematical pursuit at all. Well, it can be that, but it's really about being creative. Absolutely. And I think Nathan's, what Nathan is doing uh, is also, it's a, it's a create, it's, it's using programming as a tool for creating yeah. something whatever it is and that's when, when I was first introduced my first introduction to com computer programming was in uh, when I started my engineering course uh, we had slide rule 101 and I actually believe it or not still have my slide rule here somewhere because I can't <laughs> find it now that I want it I don't use it anymore I, I hasten to add and we had slide rule 101 and then we had Fortran programming 102 and that was my first taste of programming and I, I was already a budding electronics engineer and I said oh this is great imagine when we can start to just want to see a slide to, to our business oh here's a slide well thanks Clive yeah no worries yeah <laughs> I, I actually did a, a presentation on slide rules at the uh, microcontroller sig a few years ago and I I printed out little paper slide rules on um, on photo paper and uh, people were actually able to do and, and calculations on them so um they never run out of battery. <laughs> it just fall apart when the glue gets dry. Uh, oh, oh, you've got a bamboo one. Mine's plastic, you see, so I don't have that problem. It lasts very well. It's still got a solder, solder burn mark on it from um, 1968, I think it would be. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it is, it is a, you know, the programming is a, a creative pursuit and, and you're obviously very creative Kirsten so good on you Nathan the so how many users have you got at the moment for your flux system and uh, who, who are they good question we've I think I I've been think working to think up a question mate <laughs> thank you <laughs> I think I think the most recent time I looked it was somewhere around uh, 4,000 lecturers and then it's usually around 100 to 1 students to lecturers ratio so it's probably around about Ooh, um, pushing half a million users 
Actually, it was it was even it might have been been a bit more than that as well. But yeah, around something around four hundred thousand students. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been using it with 132 students, so it's good. Oh, cool. Oh, there we go. Yes, yeah, Clive is also at Monash, if I've got, I've got that right, Clive, but in electronics. Is that in the Faculty of IT or...? Sorry, no, 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 that's, uh, we're talking about real computer systems, okay, engineering right. and that sort of thing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> What a swipe. <laughs> the faculty of IT people are <laughs> will be angry. I, I, run the, I run the third year embedded system stuff. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. That's the real stuff. Absolutely. It's serious. Yeah, everyone, that, yeah. everyone else in the universe is trying to come up with the most complicated thing ever. And I'm like, but what do you really need in order to be able to do this stuff? And often it's not as complicated as you think. <laughs> I, I have a question for both of you. Have have people been like reaching out to you sort of saying we miss the um old way of talking being in a classroom with actual people in the same classroom <laughs> um give us ideas on how to make things better given what's happened kirsten you might be the best as a as a lecturer <laughs> have you um how's it been so i've had students last year um, I ran a Mako lab for um, third year students. And what we did was try to make it as flexible as we could. And that's where the black bubble wrap dress came from. So they had a number of tasks they had to do. They had to sew something because I wanted every student to go through the pain of doing that. Because I figured that it's a majority male class. Therefore, you know, it was good extra skill for them to have. Um, but it was like make a container. So my fairy house was actually the container. And it was make something for COVID. And it was, so for some students, Maker Lab was actually a godsend last year because it gave them a creative outlet, something different to do. For others, it was the ultimate horror because they weren't being told exactly what to do in order to get a HD. You know, so, um, I mean, you probably have a wider discussion with people, Nathan, than, than what I do. I, look, I know... It's just been really tough. It's been really tough for everyone. It's been particularly tough for people on their own, for international students. I mean, the world's just got bigger. My parents were always overseas, but it was like, oh, if we need to, we can get home from anywhere in the world in like 30 mm -hmm. hours maximum. And now it's like, you can't get home from overseas in 30 hours anymore. So I think the world has actually changed. It's almost gone back to the, it takes three months on a ship to get home, you know? So it's, uh, yeah. the world's got bigger again. John, no more in the kitchen. I know. I'm, I told you I had to attend the Melbourne PC I'll, meeting. I'll, Alec, Alec. Alec, can you please mute your microphone? Thank you. He's muted. <laughs> <laughs> Let that be a warning to the rest of you who haven't muted your microphones. <laughs> so I, I have a question about flux because I was fascinated that you had the ability for students to vote questions up um is that like a new thing is it being used much um yeah that's actually um so it's it's something that uh wasn't in any polling tools when we first brought it out um and it's slowly i think uh, i think there's at least one other tool i've heard of um, that does use a similar kind of thing where you can students can type a question and send that to the lecturer and then the other students can see those questions and then you know click upvote or downvote to um, to to say which ones they think are really uh, you know good questions. Um, and yeah, the, it's something that um, is kind of it's kind of new. Um, and I think the way the way I've been thinking about this is there's there's kind of push questions and pull questions. So the the pull questions is where the lecturers sending out a, a poll. So maybe they're saying like, what's, what, what's, what's Ohm's law? Is it A, B, C or D? And they push that question out and then they pull the data from the students. So the students answer and it's kind of a, a pull question. But then there's push questions which come from the students. And so those are the questions where, you know, without prompting from the lecturer, students are able to provide input into the lecture. And I'm really, really interested in that at the moment. And I'm thinking of, you know, ways that 
Um, similar to in Zoom, how you can you know react with a thumbs up or a hands up or something like that. Um, if we could do something similar in in real lectures, um, I think something like that would be really interesting. And that's kind of where we're starting to experiment at the moment um, with more of this kind of student push um, content. So um, a few ideas we've got is kind of like you know the worm uh, on the political debates, how you've got kind of the Mm -hmm. <laughs> audience going up and down so, you know if lecturers are interested in trying that we've, we've thought maybe we can do a you know confusion meter so you've got the <laughs> how, are, they, are the class following or are they completely dropping off at, at any moment so um we're, we're going to start experimenting over the next couple of months with a few crazy ideas like that and just see you know what student generated data student generated um content would be useful for lecturers to kind of um, have a snapshot of or, a, or of a, a feed, a live feed of that kind of information. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a very exciting kind of uh, space, I think, to to mess around in at the moment. I, I can I can see the the lecturer screen with suddenly a, a whole storm of question marks f falling down the screen as the students get confused. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is. I've I've used it as a lecturer, and um, I remember one lecture. Well, there's a couple of lectures that are really notable with Mars, which was the previous version of Flux. Okay. One was that um, I thought that I clearly explained what, you know, primary to, you know, secondary and tertiary um, sources were. And it's not that hard and it's obvious. And then we put up a, a, a Flux or Mars question of, of you know, is, the, is a book a primary or secondary, et cetera? Um, you know, is a paper, is a... Um, so that was really interesting because it, meant, it actually meant that I understood that my students didn't get it as quickly as what I thought they would. The other one that's really interesting to do with um, Mars was I was doing an ethics lecture. And so we do the trolley problem problem. And if you run the trolley, so the trolley problem is the, um, uh, I assume a lot of people know it, but just in case you don't, it's um, basically you can run five people over or you can pull a lever and only run one person over. And if you run that with a, a tool like uh, Flux or Mars, um, you get different answers to if students have to put up their hand. So you get completely different responses when they can actually be anonymous in their answers. So that anonymity um, is actually really interesting because they people don't they can admit that they don't know something, you know, or they can admit that they'll do unethical things, uh, which perhaps they wouldn't do if if everyone can around them can see them. So it actually can change the dynamics in a lecture quite significantly. Um, I have heard of some terrifying ones. Nathan, please don't go there where you give scores to the lecturer as they're going or something like that, because, you know, that that would be terrifying and distracting as you. Yeah, uh, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see this sold into Parliament House, actually. <laughs> During question time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the confusion level would be high. Yeah. And, and the revelation of uh, revelation of ethics might be um, mm, yes. <laughs> there must be quite a science to getting the right cadence growing in a classroom, where the sort of um, kids that are well, people that are not getting it. Um, like, like everyone learns at different rates, but um, the people that aren't getting it sort of need to feel like they've got an avenue to follow. <laughs> and um, so, so there must be a lot of learnings that will come out of that eventually, I'd imagine. Yeah. And Actually, I, I've now done um, you know, a lot of online teaching last year and had about 40 or 50 years of uh, ordinary t uh, lecturing in the, in the past. And uh, I must say, I still prefer the older style of lecturing considerably and in fact i find that students in the past could ask questions in a big audience without identifying themselves on zoom immediately their name comes up whenever they ask a question i think that reduces the, uh, their you know Spontaneity. yeah exactly yeah mm. clive there was nothing ordinary about your lecturing mate it's okay <laughs> i was a lecturer of mine way back when 
So I think the, but, the lecturing online when you can't see people is really problematic. So the majority of students will not put, turn their cameras on. So you're lecturing or you're talking to blank, fa you know, black screens, which is really like as a lecturer, it is hard work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how much does difference does it make if even one student turns the camera on? Absolutely huge. Yeah. Because I can, it means that you then start to cater to that particular person because you're responding yeah. to their facial expression. And, you know, because when you're in a lecture theatre, um, you're constantly responding to what, you, you know, if your students are falling asleep or whatever, then you move on or you <laughs> try to wake them up in some way or, you know, like it's an interactive environment because you're getting response from people. So if you have no response from people, it's incredibly difficult. Sorry, Graham, I cut you off. You're muted, Graham. I was just going to ask Nathan uh, whether his flux um, system was designed as, as a web-based application or whether it requires a, an app on the um, people's phones. Yeah, we. so I'm, I'm really passionate about web-based technologies because I... Um, I I was, I'm a long time like Linux user and then kind of jumping around between operating systems a lot. So, you know, nothing's available on Linux. And so I would, except for web tools because, you know, the web's available everywhere in, in a sense. So um, yeah, we so we've built Flux all entirely on web technologies um, purely for that purpose of we really just want this to run everywhere, whether or not students are running a, you know, home built, uh, mobile phone that's just been hacked together with some kind of Linux uh, mobile distribution or if they're running a you know Mac laptop or whatever it might be or an iPad we just wanted it to work absolutely everywhere no matter what so um, for me the web was kind of you know web technologies was a was a go-to choice for that that kind of thing so yeah um, terrific yeah. congratulations I think that's the perfect choice um, I'm a bit disappointed with the uh, Victorian government and their QR code reader for uh, logging where we're all going to in that you have to have a fairly modern phone um, to be able to load the app to do it. I've tried three different phones and two tablets that I have access to here and none of them will load the app. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I live in a retirement village and uh, I reckon 75% of the people here would not be able to load the app because they've all got old iPhone 4s and yep. early Androids and things like that. Yep. Um, I'd just like to comment to Kirsten uh, about her days when um, lecturing and students fall asleep. In my day, they used to hurl a blackboard duster at you. Nasty piece of wood with a bit of embedded felt in it. <laughs> So one of the new technologies, there's actually a micro, uh, I've forgotten what it's called, but it's a microphone in a foam sort of cube that you can throw to students so that they can answer questions. So oh. perhaps you could throw, you know, the, throw the cube to students to wake them up. I don't, yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> I was going to ask, is that why they got rid of the blackboards? Or is that, was it because the dust chalk. was being thrown at students? Or is it? <laughs> oh, just, just the chalk. I've had chalk thrown at me in primary <laughs> school, I can assure you. Yeah. I was allergic to the dust, chalk dust. Were you? Oh, dear. Yeah. Whiteboards were a fantastic invention. Yeah. Well, you just like, like sniffing the pens, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. Nathan, I used to teach at work uh, 25 years ago, and uh, the exams were multiple choice. Is it possible if you're lecturing to put a multiple choice up somehow uh, through your system, get them all to answer it, and you can see that only 30% have got the question right? Is yeah, that absolutely. That's, that's, that's like, that was, that's kind of the core uh, way that most people use it. That's, that's exactly, like, I think it's about 80 percent of our usage is exactly that yeah so that gives you an indication of uh, how well they're understanding what you've uh, been talking about yeah yeah exactly uh, I, I have to tell the story that um i uh, on occasions i'd have to lecture uh, teach my bosses and uh the, the, to mark these multiple choice exams i just had a template which you put over the 
top of it and saw where all the ticks were. Well, of course, I'd already written 100% on the boss's exam paper because it didn't matter what he did, he, he wasn't going to fail on me. And I had a look and I thought it's a disaster. He'd failed terribly, but of course, I had the wrong template for the wrong uh, <laughs> exam. So he, he did pass, but... Uh, <laughs> Stressful moment thinking you're going to have to tell the boss. <laughs> but you're fired. <laughs> and, and on another occasion, uh, uh, the, the, uh, I was a, a student and one of the girls uh, put a couple of crosses in the same line and the template went over and, of course, uh, in, the, in the hole, of course, there was a cross in it, so he passed, but she'd marked two boxes. Uh, she was, so she deserved to pass. She was. Oh, smart. yeah, she, she I, got I like bonus points for that. Bonus yeah. points for that, yeah. <laughs> 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 Got to be practical about things, haven't you? Am I, am I allowed to do a brief sale? Which is, I'm currently running a Kickstarter. So what I've done is packed, boxed up um, kits of uh, blocks ready to go for people to try. I thought that I could just put lots of tutorials out there and things like that, and people would be able to buy all the components themselves as cheaply as possible and um, then use them. But what I found is that people aren't really, a lot of people aren't comfortable buying. I, um, yeah, I just buy lots of random components, but also most people don't need a thousand LEDs, which is how I buy them. Um, so I'm running a Kickstarter so that to try to make this available for people with disabilities in the longer term. So if anyone wants to support that, I can put a link into the chat on, um, where to get that and I can put a link into where to get the tape as well. Please do. Please do. Actually would anybody interested be interested in just seeing a quick image of what flux looks like in use? Mm. Oh, I think well, Kirsten's I, got something our Kirsten's got yes, that planned, yes. The, uh, link in. Oh have you okay oh, all just right. a minute no worries. in the chat. Yeah because we're gonna pick it. We're gonna use it to pick a video to watch after the interval. <laughs> oh no. Okay no worries. Yeah. Yep. I feel like the um, uh, what you were just saying, Kirsten, about um, you know putting all the stuff out for free and putting the tutorials. I think maybe it's a weakness of um, of academics that we we like. I originally Mars, the, the the earlier version of Flux was all given away for free. It was all open source, and um, you know we we I was going out to schools and, and universities and saying you know this is this free software, but um, no, it turns out nobody wants to run their own servers and maintain their own you know infrastructure and i mean it's in, in hindsight it's, it's it's obvious but i guess um you know it's kind of like that reluctant capitalism where you realize okay if i provide the service i have to pay, charge money to make it sustainable and then it's you know but that's that's what people want is they just want you to um you know provide it to them make it easy and if it's a, if it's at a reasonable price point then yeah you know, it's, it's great so I, I i ran for the the um tape blocks for a couple of years with National Science Week, which was great. But this year I didn't get funding from National Science Week. So I have no money to actually run any workshops for anyone. Do you know what I mean? So, and actually there's, there's um, look, they're really good for aged care and things like that. They're, they're good for primary schools. But unless I actually package it up and make it easy for people, a lot of people, it's too hard. And also, I'm, I mean, I drive my boss when I was doing it through Monash I used to drive my boss completely nuts because I would put through a hundred different um <laughs> purchases <laughs> like I would have a, a purchase for two dollars eighty a purchase for three dollars twenty a purchase I mean it drives them completely nuts they just they want to be able to go to one place buy everything and it just work and process one receipt you know um yeah, so so actually putting it out there. I've, and, and can I say, the, the commercial thing, I've tried a few different routes of things. So I worked with Deaf Children Australia and every deaf child in Australia had some software that I um, built a few years ago for learning sign language and actually for their parents to learn sign language as well. That worked really well, actually working with an organisation. I've tried putting out an app through Monash and banged my head against the wall for three years because they thought that I would do reputational damage to the university if there was a problem with the software. Um, I had a patent on um, something which was, it's basically a spoon that goes on your finger, has a ring on it. And if you've had a stroke, it means that you can eat rice with one hand without having to chase it around. Um, I had a patent on it 
it didn't go anywhere. Do you know what I mean? So tape locks is my latest version, you know, of setting up a company and seeing if we can actually get things that make a difference out there into the community. Because mm -hmm. I find that, especially in the area that I'm in, it's, you know, you build stuff, you do research search so that you can contribute to the community, but if you can't get it out there, how do you, how do you, you know, do that? Mm. Marketing is the hardest thing, Kirsten. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You can have the, what's it, you can invent a better mousetrap, but the world will not beat a path to your door. Yes. Unfortunately, yeah. Mm. Like I look, I I I posted this uh, an invitation to this meeting on um, a two or three uh, education related Facebook pages, which would have technically reached several thousand people, and I don't think we've got anyone here who came in through that. So that gives you an idea. If anyone did come in through that, um, please speak up now. Let me hear from you. No, 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 no. So that's marketing. That's that's probably potentially seven thousand people reached, and not one one taker. They might be uh, watching the YouTube video, waiting for the YouTube video to come out. You know. I didn't tell right. them. I didn't tell them it was going to be one, Nathan. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're getting a precedent happening now. <laughs> and, and look, it's it's a sad, sad, sad thing. But you know, we are all passionate about the thing we do. Kirsten, you're you're obviously so passionate about what you do. The universe is totally indifferent. Mm. It's hard. It's, it's too it's small hard. for them to, you know, unless yeah. there's millions and millions in it. It's not, you know, it's very. I get what I do is niche. It's important to me, and it's yep. and it makes a difference to the people that are involved with it and, and yes. get the go, yep. but for the majority of people, it's not going to, you know, um, the yep. biggest, the biggest thing is actually the, why would I, you know, we offered free kits to people. It's like, why would I want to do something with electronics? And I was like, well, cause it's fun. But um, I actually last year because of COVID, we did send out kits. Uh, so we made, I made 550 different kits to send Ooh. out to people. So some of them were, were weaving electronics. Some of them were, uh, the tape block characters and things like that. Oh, I made little boxes too. Hang on. Little little light up boxes. Oh wow. Um, so they're they're all laser cut and they they were the easiest to put together boxes that you could possibly make. And um, we made PCB boards. Um, to um, with large switches so that you know they're big enough to actually. Hold, and it's all just taped together yep. and um, we sent those out to people last year and I think that was actually I wouldn't have done it like that but because of COVID we did but I think what it actually did was it gave people access to an activity that they could try at home and then perhaps they'd be more willing to come along having tried it once do you know that that by trying it at home in a safe environment actually then they they might actually be willing to come along to a maker space because they could see the value or how it, how yeah. there might be something of relevance to them. Yep, yep. Okay, well, I think, uh, yeah, Peter's about to butt in, I think, and say we're out of time for this segment. Yes, yes. Um, look, uh, Kirsten and Nathan, uh, thank you very much. As an old bloke who left school 66 years ago, um, I, I'm fascinated with the modern teaching methods. As I said before, uh, I had a... I had a slate which never broke down. Uh, you could use it a thousand <laughs> times. Uh, uh, mine was just a piece of slate. Some of the wealthier people had a uh, frame around theirs, but uh, <laughs> I, I just probably had grandma's old slate, an old one left off the roof and that sort of stuff. But uh, uh, extremely interesting. I, um, I don't think I, I'm up with it. Uh, Kirsten, I could probably understand some of your stuff. I'm a you know, a bit ignorant in a lot of these things. And David, I must tell you uh, what your comment was that uh, uh, I was obedient at school. I sadly have to tell you that uh, when I was back at Warrnambool State School uh, a couple of weeks ago, I do remember uh, the strap wasn't even in. Then I got a ruler whack over my legs because I must have been a naughty boy. I can remember I wasn't, but the teacher thought otherwise. But Kirsten and Nathan, look, thanks very much. I, I found that extremely interesting and uh, I certainly enjoyed it. I hope everyone else did. Thanks very much. 
Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank now, you're you. welcome to, to hang around, guys, if you wish. I think um, what's happening now? We're having a little break. No, no. Well, we're having a break and we're going to have a five minute break and we're going to have a uh, musical interlude uh, that Leighton West put together. And I just have a few words from Leighton. My view is that the piano roll is a relevant bit of technology in a computer club. These were, these were one of the earliest digital devices before the computer. In fact, the whole concept of ones and zeros started earlier with punch cards for weaving looms. Our forefathers were amazing inventors that made so much with so little. So my understanding is that the uh, AV people are going to put on these two... Uh, musical interludes and after that we'll be back so if you're not interested in the music uh, go and have a cup of coffee or have a cup of coffee and come back and have a look
Well, how about that? Um, I, uh, there must be something interesting on the television because I invited my wife to come in and we'd have a dance, but uh, she declined. <laughs> uh, probably not being the greatest dancer, I can understand why she didn't. Um, I'd now uh, like to hand over to our uh, uh, monthly meeting um, organiser, Kirsten Greed. It must be a Kirsten night tonight. We've got two Kirstens, and she's going to run down on this next segment of uh, using flux and uh, a bit of practicality in it. So over to you, Kirsten, if you're there. There yes, you are. I am. <laughs> so this is uh, what happens if I don't get people uh, volunteering to... Um talk and give presentations but uh, this should be fun um, so you should click the link in your flux in the chat to go to the flux poll and then you'll see a choice of uh, you, then you click the um, thing that you see and you'll see a choice of three options for what shall we watch um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about each of them there's uh, Wendell Wilson he does a lot of kind of tech talks about computer hardware and so on and um, he, this particular one's recent and really good in that um, he's uh, looking into heavy duty computers for processing data from stars to figure out whether we've got life out there in the universe. So that speaks to Nathan's uh, existential risk. Um, then Lisa Genova is really relevant to learning because uh, and she's also a very fairly recent one, I think. Um, and uh, it, it's quite good uh, in terms of understanding how one's own memory works. Um, and uh, then Jill Balty taylor is an oldie but goldie on uh, um, the uh, what happens when she, a psychologist who had a stroke and the uh, experience of that. And uh, oh, we'll post all the links on the uh, Yammer meeting live site. But anyway, if you could all uh, take your vote, I see uh, if, if you just take a few minutes, let's see how many people have voted. Um, I've got 14, 15 people have voted. So we've got, in, we've got 88 participants in the chat. Is everyone not still off getting a cup of tea perhaps? Um, Kristen, I think you need to lead us through that. When okay, so in the chat, Which there's a, a link. So in the Zoom chat. You have to click on the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Yeah. Yep. yep. Now, I'll, I'll paste it in again um, to everyone, make sure. Um, oh, right. Okay. There we go. Where's the yep. flux? There's the flux link. And then if you get into there'll be a sort of entry into it and then you'll be able to see the choice of things we want to watch. Yeah, okay. So I can see the figures. So far we've got uh, 24 people voted out of 88. I can all already see I need a, oh, 31 people have answered, 34 have answered. It's anonymous, mm -hmm. Kirsten, so we don't know who's voting. So We don't can... know who's voting. We just know the numbers. So we've got... Um... You realize right. Should I on... stop at 40 or...? You realise that on TV at the moment, they've got hard quiz with a similar sort of situation. Oh, uh, yes, that's probably very true. Yes. <laughs> I think I saw that on the news, Australia Talks or something. <laughs> All right, 42 have answered. Should I wait or should I? Uh... Oh, I think it gives them a couple of minutes. Uh, I hope Nathan's what, not watching this, that uh, we're not a very bright lot. We're not using the system too well. <laughs> oh, no, this is normal in my experience. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this is more more uh, more responses than we normally get in a lecture. So. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, oh, well. I'm feeling what my lecturer goes through now. Kind of, come on, everybody. <laughs> yes, don't be shy. <laughs> Might help if we knew what the choices meant. Uh, so I was explaining um, the uh, Wendell Wilson is an American IT. Um, he talks a lot about hardware and um, different kind of 
high tech computer stuff and uh, the the it's got this technology built to with uh, to actually get from the the data from the stars and process it to, in the search of extraterrestrial life. And then uh, Lisa Genova, oh, somebody's taken control of Zoom. Uh, Lisa Genova's talking on how your memory works, basically, uh, so, which is handy for, it's, it's pretty relevant to anyone who's learning or using their memory, <laughs> which is all of us. And Jill Balty Taylor's an oldie but goldie um, in the TED Talks on uh, the psychologist's experience of having a stroke. Well, we've got 47 people now. I think I think I'll show the screen. Let's share my screen. And uh, so um, that's how we are at the moment. And if people change, you can actually change your vote and uh, the the uh, colored bars will change as people change their vote. Yeah, you can see it moving up and down. So, um, Hugh, do you have the link for Lisa Genova? Oh, more people voting for Wendell now. <laughs> Are you there, Hugh? This is this is something we um, call the lemming effect, where you show the responses and then the students say, "Oh, everyone's picked A." So you see, yeah, everyone, yeah, yeah. Oh, I've done you, that. <laughs> all the people from the other answers go straight to the most popular answer, and it yes. just <laughs> yes. all consolidates very quickly. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Actually, there was one where I kind of did really well because there had been a mistype in the answer, and I was the only one that that scored the wrong answer and thus got the right answer. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah. Some sometimes it's best to stand your ground. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if uh, he's not about, I'll, I'll start. I'll kick off Lisa Genova. Uh, so now uh, uh, I'd like to hand over to Harry Lewis, who's uh, the I Help Man uh, for this month. Uh, the time is uh, 8.48. We've just running over a bit, but I think if members don't mind, uh, you can probably run 10 minutes over if you like, Harry. So uh, over to you. Uh, th th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Yes, I mean, the, the, I think I get hand, handle the on-off switch uh, as things drift on after the hour. So any member who wants to stay on and chat is only too welcome to do so. But you have an absolute right to go into the living room and find other refreshments or whatever you do at nine o'clock at night. Uh, we shan't be at all offended. First, a very quick note in uh, to... to a footnote, it's all footnotes before I open the floor. First footnote is to what David just said. The, for those of you who might be among those who've received their new account marching orders, but haven't yet uh, taken a step forward, you can find the instructions on the first login on the home page of Melbourne PC website. We've, we've, we've put in a new um, button below the old one for the Office 365 login. And if you pull that down, the lower choice there is to the new video. Before opening to the floor, I just wanted to put in a couple of footnotes to what Mike did last month. And in a way, it's a footnote to a slightly curious article in the current PC update, which is all about backup for Windows 7. Uh, I, th I did want, I'm going to share my screen because I, I was hoping to give you a framework. I'm not, there's no way I can talk to it, but backup turns out to be a difficult thing to discuss. And one of the reasons is that the term is ambiguous and we've discussed that a bit in Yammer over the last few days. But I thought it was good to give yourselves a chance of a step back by thinking what this is all about. And it's about disasters. And the question is, what for you are the most serious disasters in your computer world? And then how you would recover from them if they happened. The, 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 the particular item I wanted to be sure everybody understood is what we call disk image backup. 
which, which wasn't discussed much in the normal airtime last month, but we did get onto it. But the other thing I think it's important to think about is what you actually do when disaster strikes. There's a bit more to it than loading up a backup program. Now, this is only a work of reference I'm going to show you. I'm, for goodness sake, not going to try and cover this, but I thought about all the different operating systems that our members are using. And then I thought about a rough and ready division of, of backup tasks. So on the left here, you've got the operating systems uh, and uh, along the top, you've got the tasks. So not seeing your screen, Harry. Oh, haven't I shared it? Oh, what have I not done? Wait a minute. I put, no, wait a minute. How's that? Is that happening? Yes. That's good. Okay, Hello. fine. Sorry. The first one was just the headings I gave you anyway. I mean, for, for what it's worth, there it is, right? That's, that's what you didn't miss. <laughs> okay. So the idea of this is where you fit on this depends on what machine you're using and so on. I did think that the likeliest disaster, in fact, is on the bottom two rows and it's losing your phone. So it's well worth reflecting on whether you have the resources to restore the functionality of your smartphone, uh, which is not something I was offering to talk about tonight, by the way. But I think you start this, this whole thing, not from a program, but from the loss that you might suffer. So very quickly, the point about the image backups, which I actually use exclusively myself, but if it's not a familiar idea, it is that it backs up not only the operating system, which is comparatively easy to recover. The trouble is you can recover it easily without recovering everything else or even file recovery. And if you're an avid user of cloud storage, as I am, that's also trivial. Everything that's stored in the cloud is safe. What's in the middle is all your installed programs. Now, as it happens, I have 73 programs listed in the copy of Windows I'm now using. And about half of those would involve some effort on my part to restore. And that's where the image fellows come in. So final footnote then is about the recovery task, because I don't think that's come up very much lately. It's no use having a backup, a backup disk in your alternative location, safely stored with nothing else is not much use if your house has burnt down and taken all your computers with it, because you've got to have something to access them with. And one of the key tasks to prepare for that is to create the recovery media, as they like to call it. Windows will do that for Windows, but that really needs the same computer there. But the main backup programs will nearly all give you an option to create a what, uh, uh, what, what most of us would use now is a USB stick so that you can boot any computer from that stick. And if you've also got your backup disk, you can restore from the backup disk onto that computer. So a key preparation for recovery is creating the restore media. So I'll just pass that on and put back the little matrix there for you and invite anybody to challenge anything I've said or to raise anything at all they'd like to raise. And I can't see you while that's on the screen, so I might stop sharing for a moment. And then if you want it back, uh, I will bring it back. OK. Well, that was very clever, wasn't it? How do, I can start sharing. How do you stop it? Wait a minute. I practice this. Oh. I think you saw that while I looked at the top of the screen, I think, Harry. Okay. Harry? Yes. Top of the screen. John Swale. Oh, yes, I can see. Yeah. <laughs> you can see it, and I can't because it's right yeah. at the top. Okay, fine. One Thank of you. The, one of the things that often gets overlooked is that a lot of programs store 
certain data way down the chain in, in Windows. I use a lot of templates. Uh, I use a lot of autocorrect. And those things are not in the, the standard documents files. You can overcome some of that. I've changed the position of templates and I've made a templates folder under documents. But some of the other ones, you, you may not think that they're critical, but you, you need to be careful with the programs that you're using to see if they are storing things there. And you may need to back those up a little more frequently than you think when you just say you want to back up the programs. That's good, John, but you know exactly what I'm going to say, don't you? If you use a disk image program, and Windows is a pretty bad offender in this respect, it's worse than even the Macintosh operating system in this way, it hides things all over the place. And as you say, its applications do that too. Just saving the files you treasure isn't going to touch any of that stuff. And restoring the basic operating system is not going to do that either. I mean, Windows, it's been much easier now to restore Windows from a partly functioning or failed machine, provided you've created that USB stick. But there's a whole lot of stuff in the middle. I normally focus on your installed programs because it's easy to say, and some of our dear friends chatting in Yammer often say, you can just reinstall Windows. But my, you know, let's say I've got 35 programs I've installed one way or another. That is no joke, assuming I can remember which they are. And I think most people in this discussion will know one way of helping your memory, which I think we've been interested in this evening anyway. And that's a program called Bellarc Advisor. That's B-E-L-A-R-C. For a Windows user, that will document all your installed programs and quite a lot of other things you don't probably need to know about. It's just very convenient to use. It creates an HTML file that you need to store off the computer, of course, compared yes. with just downloading yes. the list yep. of um, uh, installed programs, which doesn't fill, cover all that stuff. The other thing, by the way, something Leighton West put to me earlier, earlier today, and I haven't been able to follow it up properly, is you can get little utilities that will store your passwords. And these can be very useful if you can't log into Windows because you've lost your password, for example. But I'll leave that to one side um, for the moment. But yes, John, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, th I think relying on the file backup is not terribly wise myself. Those of us who are using mostly cloud storage are automatically saving copies of our working files or whatever. Um, none of that will save those extra settings in Word or whatever. Uh, and if you reinstall Word from scratch, you won't have them back. And I think this is part of your point, isn't it? The other thing I like to mention here, by the way, you know, the most precious things to you are still going to be your files that you created. Most of us, well, many Mel PC members, and don't I know it, are still using POP for their email. POP stores most of your email on one on the one computer it's using. If you use POP on two computers, you have quite separate sets of emails. So it's important to remember that there's a file in there somewhere and you need to know how to find it that's storing your email and that's the only copy on the planet apart from one in your backup. If you're using IMAP or Exchange, it's quite different. It's like using cloud store for files. The main store is in the cloud and you can access it from any computer. Well, folks, anything at all? It's fascinating me. My screen has now neatly partitioned itself, so that almost exactly half of you are invisible. So I can tell by the ones who are visible that you're still there and awake, but I can't tell from the ones who are invisible. I'm awake. 
Yeah. No, I, no, I, no, I can see your eyes are open. Don't you worry. <laughs> oh, that's David. He's, he's, got, he's, um, he's hiding himself, is he? Have you got gallery view on or speaker? I do view? have gallery. I, I switched oh. to gallery view yeah, okay. to, to get something more interesting to look at. I'm sorry, even more interesting things to look at than the single screen I had at the time, which was of just one member. Well, we've got all sorts of things there, haven't we? We've got palm trees, we've got disembodied heads, we've got flowers, we've got distinguished looking grey beards with Mr. Hall. It's all over the place. I think Peter McConaughey's good. He's got a reservoir behind him. Oh, yes, yes. So I think it's time we raise the tone of this, isn't it? I'm afraid I'm not a contributor today. <laughs> um, in my Google Meet, I do have a, a, a beach view, and I must do something about this quite clearly. While you're talking about uh, Zoom as well, there are some big updates coming, coming through, and uh, people should make a habit of updating their Zoom before they log into something like this. Doesn't Zoom tell you? Doesn't it do it automatically, John, and tell you? No, not necessarily. Okay. Is anything exciting coming, or is it just a matter of not being well, there was compatible? Promo emails came through in the last twenty-four hours. Uh, it depends what you call exciting, but uh, they're certainly adding quite a lot of features. All right. I think it's mainly in the business world. Well. Harry, yes. Uh, if people go up to the little green shield on the top left-hand corner, click on yes. that, and there's over to the right of the drop uh, drop out box is a gear wheel. If you click yeah. on that, it will take you down to statistics. It will tell you which version of uh, Zoom you're using. I'm using five point four point two. Well, I updated this afternoon and I got 5.6.6. Oh, my God. I'm dead jealous there, John. I'll have to do something about that, won't I? Well, mine's 5.6.5, .5, so I need to up that as well. This is not a race, you lot. <laughs> mine's only 5.4.9. and It didn't give me a message. I actually signed in to Zoom before I signed into this meeting. So uh, I would have thought that it would have done an auto update, but it doesn't. It's mildly surprising because most programs do that, don't they? Yeah. I get bad badgered almost daily for updates to some of my programs. Well, I've had problems in the past logging into some um, conferences I've been on uh, because my Zoom wasn't updated. No, that's the sort of thing I'd yeah. expect, John. Yeah. And I mean... Fact, it, some some of us manage to use TeamViewer quite a lot with members, and some members have very old copies of TeamViewer, and then you have to wait patiently until they download the latest one because it really won't play yeah, with the well, older ones. I had the embarrassing situation of being halfway through a presentation when it decided to update, or it, did, it insisted that I updated, otherwise it crashed. Has Kirsten got a parrot as well? <laughs> I heard. I was watching what that. Yes. Oh, which Kirsten? <laughs> no, not no. Kirsten. Kirsten. Does Kirsten. everyone know about these? So, in the ah. um, <laughs> I, I spend far too much time. Um, <laughs> there's basically that. video filters. In if you go to video, then up the side arrows, filters. Um, you can do all sorts of. Wah, wah, wah. Um, oh. Yeah. Or you oh. can get smarter and graduate, or um. You can do 3D things or... Um, oh, quickly, quickly, quickly. What are those glasses called? <laughs> the, uh, a technical term. Uh, are they 3D glasses? Um, yep. uh, that's a technical term. I can't remember it myself, but I'm just challenging yeah. it. Oh, I remember. John, you've, you've got... You've got rivalry. <laughs> John Hall has the, has the beard and white hair to suit God, <laughs> except I'm not sure God wears glasses. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Now I can be safe for the meetings. <laughs> Where do you get those filters from, oh, Kirsten? Okay, so we, we can do a... Um, so if you go to um, the video, where the video icon is at the bottom of the screen, there's an yeah. arrow that points upwards. Yeah, I've got so that go screen. To, it says I haven't got any filters. You go to video I, filters. All right, choose virtual oh. background, choose video there's filters. Virtual backgrounds, right. there's a tab beside it, which is yeah. video filters. Yep. And it's empty. The list is empty. It just says none. 
Oh, you poor thing. Yeah, I, I, oh. I, I'm devastated. Okay. Well, and, and can I just add, you can also, within those settings, for those who want to play with it later, you can um, sharpen up your eyebrows, um, give yourself a moustache. <laughs> Don't worry, Kirsten's gone to heaven. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> <Keep> on. <laughs> well, I've placed myself inside my 3D printer instead. <laughs> my goodness, you're, you're, you're all just there. kids at heart. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta have a bit of fun. I disrupted the meeting. <laughs> Back your age. Oh, and there's my metho martini. But actually, it's an incredibly, it's incredibly like good technology in terms of if you actually like with the pirate hat on, you can actually kind of you can sing a sea yep. shanty and it'll yep. follow you. Mm. I, I was looking at you, Kirsten, before, and I thought you'd actually put something on. I said, well, yeah, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> there we go. All Some quite disturbing time. things happening to people here. Yeah, but <laughs> I confess, that reverting to my original background, which is not quite what's behind me in reality. Right. The only useful thing is the blurred background. If you have a look at mine, you can't see the what's behind me. Behind you. Yeah. And uh, that can sometimes hide embarrassing stuff. It just means you need to go to spec savers, John. <laughs> <laughs> this is commercial free. <laughs> oh, Northern Lights. Well, that was completely fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> um, any other left field questions or comments? Yes, I have one. And, uh, I sent you an email about five minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> I think I recognize that voice. Uh, I got a, uh, yes, I thought so. It sent me an email. How do you start to see my emails at the same time? Young no, not really? to you, but to... Uh, oh, you did, a, you did a, a, what's it, a comment, did you? Yeah. A chat. Oh, I see, right. Yes. Are we all going out for Chinese meal tonight, Tom? Yes, uh, at home. <laughs> yes, I'm I going out for a that. glass of wine at home. I often use well, that in the gallery all. review, Tom. And I got a hundred exactly when I joined the meeting earlier on. Uh, because there were 20, what it, 20 per screen, weren't there? Four by five. So it's not difficult to compute that, though it comes up as well in, in the um, screen that... that uh, John was telling it was a John was telling us about where you can. Uh... Well, can I, can I read it out to you? So, who are you talking to, Tom? <laughs> I lost it's not my video again. Yes, okay. Well, Nathan's got himself a thingy too now. What's that? I've gone, uh, I don't know if it's a monster or an alien. <laughs> that is very, very strange. A cyclopean. <laughs> I, I'm really impressed with the, um, it keeps the perspective. Like if I lean up, you can see it squishes the. Yeah. Yep. I, I use Google Meet. I want me to read it up to you. It's about the topic that I raised two meetings ago. Kirsten Ellis has got an old Parisienne. I, I think. Tom, Tom has a, a question for Tom's you, Harry. He, he, might, he wants to ask it, I think, would be the best way, Tom. Are you right? Uh, the email I sent uh, to, um, what is it, uh, more um, uh, at Zoom. Um, it seemed, uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, email via my email address. Uh, through the Gmail server. All seems to be operating very well, except a nuisance issue that I don't seem to be able to stop certain spam or quasi spam being automatically downloaded into my PC Thunderbird uh, inbox. Well, uh, I opened up uh, yeah. um, the Google um, server, uh, mail, and then I looked in the inbox, I marked it as a spam, 
and went into the spam folder. Next time the same and similar uh, email spam and went to Gmail spam folder. It, it recognized it was a spam, but it still automatically downloaded into my PC uh, from the bird inbox. Yes, I'm mildly surprised at that, and I have to ask one of our I can't hear you very well. Um, okay, let me see. Where am and I? Then I tried, I tried from the spam folder uh, to select delete forever. There is a uh, delete forever. It deletes it, but it does not seem to be effective a lot of time. I think it's sort of from time to time it's effective, and sometimes it's not. Yeah, well, f first point, I think you do understand this, but so everyone understands, and it's no different from Microsoft and so on, to train the Google spam police, you have to go to the web interface. Yes, I did that. I know, I'm, I, know I know you said that. I just wanted everyone to be clear about that. Now, it is supposed to learn, and we shouldn't have to do this, but if you really are getting consistent spam from a one source, you can exclude that source by setting up a rule, a filter. But because normally spam comes from all over the place. I'm, I'm puzzled though that you're receiving into your inbox things that are being put into spam in the cloud. Are you using POP or IMAP? Oh. Oh, I thought so. I think this may be the problem. Um, of course, if you're using IMAP, there's been no difference. What you understand that it may be your pop is as a is a very simple thing, and it may be that the way it's handled by Google, uh, who don't like pop at all, by the way, they make life quite difficult for people who use pop, uh, means that even before the filter gets to it, it's done the pop download. But I can check on that. It's quite an interesting idea. Uh, by the way, talking about deleting all your spam on in the web, it only lasts 30 days anyway. Okay. With, with, with the smaller storage, it's a good idea to keep our mailboxes as small as we can, particularly if you want to use the Google Drive. Because in the fashion of Google, it's putting them all into the same box. Microsoft wasn't putting them all into the same box and Microsoft had bigger boxes anyway. So it's a good idea to keep down the size of your mail, your mailbox, particularly if you're using the Google Drive in earnest. And for those of us using Google Photos in using our Mail PC account, of course, because it's only going to count. There won't be many people like us. I mean, I'm not one of them, sorry. I'm using Google Photos, but in another account. If you had by any chance been using Google Photos with your Mail PC Gmail, by now all new photos are going to count against your 30 gigabytes. There'll be a very small number of members in that position, I think. Uh, uh, one particular um, type of uh, what I call spam yep. is from Facebook. Various people who, for some reason, uh, decide that I'm a friend or uh, that I'm interested in their posting on Facebook uh, will, for some reason, it's not them, but Facebook itself reminds me that they have posted something on their, uh, on their Facebook. And there's a, a couple of persistent one that I hardly know them. And they, it comes up that so-and-so has posted a picture. So-and-so's uh, uh, did so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, it's a nuisance. Tom, um, you'll have to talk to your daughter about that. I think she manages your Facebook account for you and she can stop those messages from coming through to you. So. Um, have a word with your daughter. It, it's, they're not spam. They're genuine messages from Facebook to your account. So um, when I, I posted a photo of you at, at lunch at Christmas, your daughter saw that and she commented and um, 
you would have received a, a, a message in your inbox about that. So they're not they're not spam. They're genuine. Well, I think John, can I can I come in briefly? I, I think this is part of the problem, isn't it? That what we might think is, from our point of view, we get badgered by the the your average spam filter average i mean look google microsoft apple a handful of others put huge resources into protecting us from 99% of the spam that comes into our that, that's directed to our addresses that we never see uh, when i looked up the figures the other day the proportion of global email that spam was put at 45% which is an improvement over the last 6 years but most of us never see any of that at all but on the other hand if um, you really want not to see email from a, a one particular sender, say Facebook, you can actually block it. Yes. Now, whether you really should be doing that is the other question, of course. And I think I think I'll leave um, you guys to sort that out between you. That's why I suggested that Tom talk to his daughter. Yes. Uh, well, that's probably yes. the best way of, of resolving. Does she want him to see things uh, or, or does she not? Yeah, yeah well, that, that's just fine. You see, we've, we've had a wonderful time exploring the resources of Zoom to enhance ourselves. And now we've got family counselling, you know, <laughs> so speak to your daughter. Yeah. Right. The, uh, I, to counter Tom's argument, I have found spam getting through to, uh, I've kept the, uh, Microsoft account open and the Google account and I found spam getting through to the Microsoft account which has been blocked by Google. Yes. Good one. Uh, so That's I our think, impression John. I think the Google, the Google is much better at catching yeah. spam. Google yeah that that tells us two, well, two different things actually. One of the things you just said which follows the impression of us who are working with the members who are on both sides a lot but also that the consignment to spam comes after email is forwarded yes yes so that that's very important for what we're doing i mean as you heard from what david read out um there have been a, a small number but of course there should be zero uh, messages that haven't been getting through with the forwarding um and we, i mean this is a, a, it's a bit like other things in our minds at the moment. It's a very small problem in a way, but of course, it, it's, if you can't trust what's going on, then it's not going to work. So a lot of hard work, a lot of research has gone into this and we've solved the problem for the time being. But um, it's vitally important that all your messages get through to the Google service. Yeah, I think uh, for Nathan and, and Kirsten's benefit, and I thank them for staying on to the end of this meeting and watching all the, the shenanigans that, that go on at one of our regular meetings. One of the things that I tried to do in the past was to build a relationship between uh, some of the universities and, and our members, because as you can see, our, our membership is getting much older. We're, we're getting to 75, 80 year olds as an average age and uh, and I had uh, one member who was a senior executive at Shell and was an absolute genius this guy could actually program galaxies colliding with each other uh, he phoned me in an absolute panic the other day because he'd given the MAC address of his uh, modem to somebody who purported to be his IP provider. Now, I would like to reach out to the universities and say, well, people like Harry have been, sorry, Harry, I don't know how long you've been on help desk, but I'm, I'm, ex, I'm expecting that it's well in excess of 10 years. Um, and some of our help desk members have been there for 20 odd years. Yes. I would really love to see a relationship being built between the universities and the Melbourne PCU user group, because where in the past we were the people that helped other people, as you can hear from the conversations that are going on now, 
many, many of our members are starting to need help themselves. And how can we get the universities to actually recognize that? Think about that, please, because, you know, we've, we've, we've tried and tried and tried to reach out to the universities. And David is doing a much better job than I ever did <laughs> because he's got two brilliant speakers for tonight. Um, well, sorry, Kirsten. And David. <laughs> and David, yeah. <laughs> No, that's, David. Kirsten. that's Kirsten. Kirsten, no. sorry, Kirsten, but the, uh, the team. Well, we, the team. we actually got one each. That was. <laughs> we have got at the moment. We have got a brilliant team uh, in, on our committee who are actually reaching out and bridging the gap. Well, we want between more. us oldies and and the you youngsters. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, but, but oh, look, I'm nudging sixty. That's not really young. We want the. the people that are at uni that are new students to uni we want them yes, to yes. but what i what i'm saying is i i would like to see a two-way sort of uh but one of our biggest on. assets is our uh, tech seniors yes yeah. <laughs> well um, harry's a good asset for a start look <laughs> the world has changed so much in the just like since 2000, well, since the iPhones came out and everyone got sucked into social media, the world has changed so much. Yeah. And actually, the elder techos are a kind of a grounding influence. So hang in there. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just saying that uh, if there's anybody who's feeling really uh, that they need to help old people, in universities, well, maybe they could start some sort of uh, project. How you that. say it? Go say it like that. <laughs> Do that. That's it's, all. It's kind of the need for wisdom. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's the things like the the you know people using uh, social communications and whatever that uh, and and you know quite often you'll find people getting very confused about. Facebook and oh, I don't want to touch that. They they're looking, you know, they know everything about you and, and whatever. Well, they are true. missing out on, on a lot of social <laughs> interaction that they could be having. These people are 80, 90 years old. Mm. The only time they actually talk to anybody is in a meeting such as this, and this is once a month. Um, and they're not getting the feedback that they they could have. Um, you know, so I'm just just thinking aloud that uh, maybe the universities could start thinking about older people. Well, what about the older people thinking about the younger one? <laughs> well, Can I say that. That? In fact, David David is running uh, programs for the for the for the youngsters uh, doing the coda dojos and all oh, yeah. of that sort of stuff. So we are trying we we're trying to pass whatever knowledge we've got to the youngsters, but I'm not seeing much coming back the other way. So, um, to, to encourage, like, like for young people in their late teens, early 20s, to, to help them get started, as in getting into doing stuff, you know, like making coding, whatever. Well, they all are doing it in their bedrooms, <laughs> like Minecraft and everything. But um, to actually get out and engage with people, We've got such a fantastic mm. venue and um, mm. such a fantastic um, membership base that there must be ways to use it more. Um, to, to, so mm. we'll keep inviting guests and... Yeah, I mean, yep. <laughs> two brilliant guests tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and Ellis was about to say something, I think. Uh, I was just saying, there's actually an incredible amount of goodwill um, like within the university and students who want to volunteer. I, you know, I've run, run makerspaces for people with disabilities and I've always had lots of students volunteering. We run, um, uh, there's a team that, that write websites for, for um, not-for-profits. You know, there's, there's actually an incredible amount of, of good with, will within the university, but sometimes making those connections is really hard. Like, like just finding the entry point is the hard part. Um, I know we, I, in the last week I've run a, a um, there's lots of people around Monash University who work with people with disabilities. We don't connect together, let alone outside the university. You know, like 
I work with, you know, five, ten different organisations, um, there are people working with those same organisations that I don't even know that exist within the university, you know, so um, those communication channels, we really do need to work on those, but there is a lot of goodwill in it and a lot of people. Um, we are always looking for research participants, for, for example, you know, that um, to get different perspectives on things, um, you know, and, and it's always a, oh, where will we find people, you know, so so I think there are things that we could do together that, that um, my boss is quite keen to, for me to keep chatting with David and, and see if there's things that we can do together. No, I think I think it's really great that we've got your people like you talking to us these days, which is wonderful. So thank you. Really. I, I was I was going to say, John, that um, my head just disappeared. Oh dear, look at that! <laughs> I've lost my head. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that the the challenge with the university, I think, is they are very diffuse organisations, which is sort of what uh, Kirsten was saying in a in a different sort of way. Um, just to let you know, sometime after this, Chris and I are going to sort of get together, have a cup of coffee and, and just explore uh, how we can work together. It, it will be probably much more with focus on young people than on old people. But I think that if we establish those links, the, the, they will start to reciprocate anyhow. If we can get sort of lively networking ha happening with unis and other sorts of organisations. So, um as you, you mentioned, we're running the Coda Dojo. I take very little credit for that and sort of maybe creating the environment for it to exist in. Um, and that addresses sort of the nine to 13 year old Kirsten range. Kirsten's a little more interested, I think, in slightly older people and university students. She was telling me the other day about some of the very amazingly creative stuff that happens in her, her workshops, uh, um, Makerspace. And I'm looking forward to visiting that. Um, yeah, so it's it's a one thing is for sure. It's always a slow process, you can, and we've had a number of, of starts that have not really led to anything. But we keep on, and when you see an opportunity, we keep on having those cups of coffee. So I'm all <laughs> caffeined out. Keep up the good work, folks. <laughs> yeah, great I, job. And I, look, I've I got hate... a glass of wine beckoning here, guys. So I'm going to say yes, thank you and over and out. I, I was just about to say, I hate to be a party pooper. Um, I'm dready cursed and ringing me tomorrow and saying you let the meeting run half an hour over time. But uh, I see we're still recording. But I think uh, yeah. possibly if we uh, call the meeting to a close now, uh, as we've said, that uh, you can continue on talking. Uh, the meeting's still open. But uh, I'd like to thank Kirsten, Nathan and David for the presentation. That was very excellent. Uh, Kirsten and Hugh for the flux exercise, uh, David Stonia Gibson for his president's report, and Harry Lewis for I help. You didn't have to, didn't have too many curly questions there, Harry, but it's uh, much appreciated. And to the two, uh, uh, well, Kirsten from the university. Um, I'm in the older bracket, unfortunately. My wife says I'm not allowed to tell anyone, but uh, I look in the mirror every day, and uh, I'm reminded. But uh, uh, some people are keener on the younger ones, but I'm sure that, uh, and I've done a couple at the university, they're looking for some older heads uh, to, to see what older heads think about. And uh, uh, I think that possibly, you know, our organisation, if you're looking for something in that field, would probably be interested in uh, a few of us oldies um, sharing what little knowledge we've got. Um, uh, we, uh, strangely enough, we have got a lot of uh, knowledge uh, that uh, you don't even know existed. And uh, as an example, I got so excited, I was stopping people on the street. Uh, at 81, I told a couple of youngsters that I did something the other day that they will never, ever possibly be able to do at 81. I took my first selfie. And when they're 81, they will have taken that many. It won't be their first. So... Uh, you know, we, we have got something to offer the youngsters. But look, thank you all, everyone. Uh, we'll call the meeting to a close uh, officially. And, uh, you know, you can continue on uh, chatting amongst yourselves. But uh, thanks and good night. <laughs>